my tenure there between late 60s, it was 70, 71, 72, 73. The balance of female graduate students etched up and that uh, was a temporarily low income population <laughs> due to the student loans and demands, some of whom had children and that was an institution where there were no counseling services beyond academic work with the academic deans, or if you could fell apart completely, you were uh, admitted to the infirmary and had psychiatric ser services, but there was nothing in between the two. Uh, it was, I very quickly identified that and set up a counseling program on campus. I also set up a sliding fee daycare for graduate students, primarily faculty, second, local alum, and then the local community. And this was a um, not only sliding fee, but it was also a <laughs> complicated scheduling so that you could drop in and drop out. I started because I wanted, there was a number of nursing mothers that couldn't get to their kids mm -hmm. while they were doing their graduate work. And that's what I started out doing. The only other counseling I did was at, at, besides those assignments that were undergraduate and graduate school based. I had a, the work study program was my responsibility. So I interfaced with admissions and financial aid. And the kids that came to me were the ones that were most financially stressed. Mm -hmm. So at this particular institution where every child had been top of their class academically, valedictorian, whatever, it was very easy for the undergraduates to lose a sense of themselves because everybody else, they were no longer distinguished from the group. Mm -hmm. Sort of like my experience at Syracuse University where it seemed like every undergraduate female had been captain of cheerleaders at her relative school. <laughs> Couldn't figure out if everybody else was wearing white vinyl boots and fishnet stockings, <laughs> who they were. Well, at Bryn Mawr it was a little different. It was a different, it was the same problem with a different group. Mm -hmm. And often I had kids at work study who were going to have to drop out of school because they sent their book money home because the family refrigerator broke down and they didn't. And there were other children and they needed to help the family survive. So that was my initial interest in low income students and the stresses that the additional stresses that that puts on your life, re regardless of where you are, or what you're doing. Did you have support from other faculty when you were doing that or did it was it kind of out there and people didn't really agree with what you were doing or see the need for it? Um, it was not, it was a fairly, Bryn Mawr College at that time was a very, I would call it academically narcissistic. The faculty on the whole were interested in their own research. They had very little time for the graduate students. They considered it a graduate institution and undergraduates were sort of the slime and scum on the pond. They really would, didn't get very much academic support or any other kind. Mm -hmm. You were supposed to be intellectually rigorous and therefore a creative problem solver who could solve their own problems. And I would have to say every single young woman that I met there as an undergraduate was theoretically capable of those things. The, uh, <laughs> however, creative problem solving on a theoretical level does not always translate itself into how to get yourself out of a paper bag if you're stuck in the street in the middle of a paper bag. Mm -hmm. So that kid who has to make a choice between her siblings having food and her book money is, doesn't matter how smart you are, there are ramifications to that problem that cognitive prowess doesn't necessarily help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Did it continue on after you left? At Bryn Mawr at the institution, being uphill, the services, yes, they continue to this day. Mm -hmm. oh. I would say that that was a contribution that I can. <laughs> the daycare is going wild. It's taken over a second church that was, was in what we had a, the VDN Thorn was a preschool on campus that was experimental preschool for, so that the students had little, little people available to them, but it was not a low income group. Uh, it was a local affluent group in the private preschool, mm -hmm. which was very hard to get into. The daycare was a different thing. And there's now a second one in the second church adjacent to campus mm -hmm. that's uh, t functioning. The counseling service is going full swing. 
um, the, the once counseling system that I set up for the employees is no longer functioning. At the time I went to Bryn Mawr, all of the uh, building and ground, first of all, the women's dorms, they had maids that made their beds every day. And, and all of the maids and all of the groundskeepers were, many of them were interrelated. They were all from the same county, St. Mary's County in Virginia, in, in Maryland. And they were all black and or define themselves as African-American. And um, they were there for the night, the school was closed in the summer and they left their children at home with other family members and they worked the academic year and then they went home for the summer. Uh, Reverend Sullivan was a <laughs> rebel rouser of the period. And I started, I got in touch with him and we set up training programs on campus for these folks and uh, GED, secretarial, you know, and so that and counseling to go along with that. And I think everybody that didn't have a GED got one. And there are several of the maids were promoted to administrative and secretarial posi clerk positions in various places in the college. And by the time I left, there was a shift in that that was permanent, I would say. Wonderful. And that was discontinued. That counseling program was discontinued. Okay. I, see. I was simultaneously living in a residential boarding school across the street, uh, and uh, which gave me my room and board. And uh, that was evenings and weekends taken care of. I had 20 little girl, young women, little girls between the ages of 14 and 18 that were my responsibility. And I would say a third of them had serious mental health problems and that's why they were in boarding school. I had one full blown schizophrenic. Um, this was a boarding school was a, is a tradition in Philadelphia in that particular, a lot of people from West Virginia, rural, more rural communities in the five state area sent their children there and had for generations uh, so that was a very affluent group, but no less troubled. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So while you're at Bryn Mawr doing the administrative stuff, you were also running this boarding school at the same time? Yes. Wow, that's a lot. And that's quite a legacy that you left behind there. I didn't know any of that. Very interesting. While I was doing my PhD. So there was really three full-time jobs. Wow. I don't know and how to manage that. And I did that and I was because I was putting my children who was my then husband was going to Penn uh, Medical School and I was supporting us. So that made it, a, I was able to do it that way. That's his, his parents were, her parents were able to pay room and board and tuition. They voted, to, they chose, because I don't think they thought I was appropriate uh, to, to pay his tuition, but I supported us otherwise. Wow, incredible. <laughs> Um, what was your biggest challenge as far as creating the counseling center? Like, how did you fund it if if people couldn't afford to pay? Um, how did you get counselors to work there? Who who was working there, etc.? I um, drafted. Uh, <laughs> I'm a fast talker. I got the School of Social Work mm -hmm. faculty and students, advanced students to start, mm -hmm. and also in my clinical group. <laughs> this through the early childhood program there were people that were coming in with uh who already had master's degrees and or higher level degrees and were working on a phd in early childhood but they had a more generalized master's degree and they and i organized with the faculty through the president's goodwill and his enthusiasm for my programs to get cooperation so it was really funded by as was my graduate work funded by the college well so so let me get it straight so you had the the daycare going on for children of students at Finmar, and then you had the boarding school for local residents and young girls, and then that, that was that was only those girls that were in the boarding school. I only did that. The undergrad, the undergraduate and graduate general counseling center on Bryn Mawr College was a struggle because the faculty, the deans, and the infirmary all had their own turf. And they didn't really like the idea of a generalized council. It crossed too many lines. It was not cooperative. The idea of teamwork hadn't hit there. Mm -hmm. Everybody was sort of authoritarian and had and had notched out their little fiefdoms. 
and we're not the struggle was getting people to communicate see common goals and share resources gotcha. and it had to be in and the way i did it was by getting the president of the college and the dean to for the deans to realize that the social and emotional problems that were interfering with the academic work that they were so so focused on they didn't if they, they couldn't serve those needs, better to delegate them to somebody they could and specialize in the area. They could. So it was a matter of respecting other people's expertise is the way I finally solved the problem. Everybody was ha happy to be an expert. And as long as they were identified as an expert in something, they would share their expertise across the board. Gotcha. That's... I, I sound cynical, I know, but <laughs> I have a different different perspective at my age than I did when I was 20. So. I mean, I believe it. And that sounds like a great solution to get people to work together. It's insane that they wouldn't want to cooperate. That's um, surprising to me. Yeah, uh, most poor behavior is fear based yeah. and power is is always a factor. Um, the first faculty meeting I went to at Bryn Mawr College, I discovered which happened, the subject happened to the faculty synod was about the heating plant the, that was making all the buildings work. And I was fascinated to watch an Italian professor and an art history professor, who, each of whom were experts, I'm sure, in their subjects, assume that their point of view was equally valid on the subject of building and grounds. Wow, yeah, people will do that, people will do that, that's, that's crazy. I thought to myself, uh-huh. <laughs> You gotta be kidding me! <laughs> but you can work together, so it worked out. So who who were the? So you had the counseling program for the faculty, the maintenance workers, and the maids, right? And then you had a separate one. Um, it was only the maintenance. It was only staff maintenance and maids, and it was all strictly that counseling program was strictly focused on career counseling and changing their and expanding the possibilities because I wanted to change the structure of the campus. For, for instance, I thought it was, I didn't want anybody to lose their job. And in order to phase out the bed making and the picking up, you have to have some place for people to work. And in order to do, I wanted to make sure that nobody looked. I couldn't do the one without doing the other. I couldn't change the dynamics of the campus situation that I thought was appalling mm -hmm. without for myself without assuring that there was a path that would work. I didn't want anyone to lose their job because of this. Well, I, I so in order to change the greater picture, you have to figure out what the parts are so that nothing, because people often don't think through projects and there are unanticipated consequences that create more problems than the one you think you've successfully solved. So yep. it's very, very important when you're doing uh, human interaction stuff to take the long view. Mm -hmm. we, we've been talking a lot about that in our class and do no harm frameworks and, you know, brainstorming the possible negative consequences of our good intentions because there's there's plenty. So that's what he's talking about. Johnson's great society being an example, mm -hmm. closing the mental health facilities and find and assuming that families are going to have the resources to take care of it. Pretty stupid. Mm -hmm. Also, the whole welfare model when you pay people who don't have uh, husbands, uh, if you pay if you, you have to look at the model you're supporting, the ramifications of the welfare system was to bring low-income fathers out of the household. Mm -hmm. And now we have a, an entire underclass. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So I'm not trying to do any of that, but <laughs> I do wanna do something. But that is also what creates mental illness. Right. When you have fractured families Absolutely. and you have children without resources, mm -hmm. right. that's where it starts. Mm -hmm. And my very first interest was children that institutionalized infants that had been abandoned. And I, one of the reasons I trained as a, as a massage therapist was when you're working with very young children where the damage has been done uh, pre-verbally by neglect or abuse, the endocrine system shuts down and, one of the, and touching is one of the ways and working the body is one of the ways of in infants of getting that whole system to respond again. Mm -hmm. I didn't know you did that either. So that's all this is I didn't know any of this background. So this is all really interesting to me. We'll have to have more conversations in the future. Um, but uh, I won't make you talk again about the second two points, but I do want to ask about your work with children and at risk children, especially if you could speak more on, on that one. Uh, my when you say at-risk children, what is your definition? 
low income, probably don't have access to services, may have difficult family situations. I'm in PG County, which is where I expect to do my work. And there's a lot of poverty here and just lack of resources, so. Okay, so when I finished my classwork for my PhD and I testing and I was working on, and it was time to do the thesis, mm -hmm. I had had enough of Bryn Mawr College mm -hmm. and its design and its, <laughs> and its first world problem. Right. even though there were some third world <laughs> uh, 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 international students and a few low income students, not many. They were on the upswing at that time. The systems that I helped put in place, I think were good, but I was pretty much done with that faculty and mm -hmm. with that location. And I was able to get myself, a, a well, a job came in uh, for a, a faculty position at a fully funded faculty position at Drexel University and I couldn't get any of my colleagues, I mean, any of my fellow graduate students to, to take it because Drexel University had been an institute of technology and Bryn Mawr is an, a scholarly academic institution, not a work study functional institution. Drexel had just become a university at that point. And it paid three times what any entry level position at the faculty at Bryn Mawr paid. And I thought, I'm gonna take that. Mm -hmm. So I went from being a graduate student to being an associate professor at Drexel University in the human behavior department with my own funding. Wow, that's very impressive too. Jeez. <laughs> what I discovered, and I, there was also an experimental nursery school there again, but that was more interesting to me because that was half and half. It was half temporarily poor graduate students and half low-income local community kids. And we had, we were working, in, and we worked with uh, Carnegie Mellon in conjunction with Carnegie Mellon. There was a very early computer learning program. This was 1973. <laughs> I can remember being delighted because the, the keyboard was color coded and you, and you painted the children's fingernails with the color of the keys they were supposed to be on to teach them to, how to type in through the machine. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. And I had, um, my focus, my graduate work, my focus in my PhD work was moral and sexual development in very young children. And the money that was funding my research was, uh, came out of the same pocket as Head Start. And after I, about six months of gathering, out, of planning and how I was gonna gather the data in my field work, it seemed to me that there was enough data and what the government should be doing was putting money into Head Start so that there was some, if you know that the local preschool program or the community itself thinks that physical abuse of children is good behavior management or locking them in a closet and telling them that there are rats in there that are going to eat them if they're not good, it's really time to get into the field and do some adult training. <laughs> so I switched my focus very rapidly and I stopped doing direct services. And I was teaching and designing, uh, instead of collecting data, I was designing educational programs for early childhood and at home, pre preschool infant management. Mm -hmm. I, work, I worked with Ira Goldman at the University of Florida for that a little bit. And I ended up, um, changing my talking the funding source, which was then called HEW region three early, uh, child, uh, early childhood division into designating the money as a training and technical assistance grant instead of a research grant, which took some doing. And then I spent the next 10 years evaluating the quality of Head Start program, the, changing the system that they use to refund and evaluate Head Start for refunding. And what I did is I set up a planning and evaluation system that taught the local parents and people and the staff how to plan, how to evaluate their programs. And because I built in, I took most of the money and put it into training. So I taught the community and the staff how to self-evaluate. And then I went in with experts and to match their evaluation, compare them, designate a plan forward and fund it so that they got additional, I used my research money to fund training in, in the local communities and bring expertise in to support them. 
and it grew uh, the, the pilot program that I designed, the national office here in Washington was interested in and they wanted to put, and they, uh, I, I, and they wanted to hire me and, and I said, this program was designed with your money, I'll give it to you, but I would like a management piece. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. I ran that out of my living room or out of my dining room for 10 years. For 10 I years. stopped teaching and just did Head Start. Oh. Huh. So yeah, the, the and I changed the administrative functioning. Yep, I changed the evaluation planning system and was able to do lots of amazing things. A lot of which I might say as an aside to you was because at Bryn Mawr College where the status symbol was never to wear makeup and look like your grandmother. I usually <laughs> wore my mother-in-law's clothing, never had any makeup. I had very long hair like yours, which I always wore in a knot or you know, a chignon or a French, you know, some tied back and severe with no makeup. So when I went for this job interview, I was 24 and they thought I was 35. Because <laughs> I didn't look like any other 24 year old. I was very serious. I had very large glasses and I had no makeup and I was dressed like a 50 year old. <laughs> so they, I, and that is a whole other conversation about what was going on in the seventies. Yeah. So life has always been a costume party for me and you have to check out who your audience is. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. I haven't done many interviews right now. So I'll keep that in mind. A hot 24, a hot 24 year old does not get a 35 year old's job. No. I'll keep that in mind. So I'll try to look, look as old as I can. <laughs> yep. Nothing wrong with brown oxfords and a tweed. <laughs> and thick and thick glasses. I have the thick glasses. I don't have the oxfords and the tweed, but I can get that. <laughs> you can get the thrift the thrift shop will help you out. I may still have some old well, let me look in my closet. I may have some. <laughs> I may have a fair, I may have a fair aisle sweater and a t matching tweed skirt from that era. Perfect, my new interview outfit. It worked great. <laughs> if it the the human behavior human behavior has always been very interesting to me, and I think the study of human motivation has always been helpful. And while I went from the micro to the greater community because obviously when I, I made a, I had a pretty fast trajectory from direct services to adolescence to moving down the scale in age. That was clearly the problems were already there in adolescence. Mm -hmm. So I figured you have to move back. The earlier you can intervene, the better off you are. Right, that's and right. then and then it gets into the family network because to have a healthy infant, you have to have a healthy community. You have to have a family that's solidly behind them and hopefully the family's gonna have some support. It's a naughty problem and it hasn't changed. It really is. I, I don't think it has either because my, my initial planning was, like you said, I just kept going lower and lower and lower. At first I thought I wanted to do programming for adolescents and then I thought, but what about the family they come from? But what about educating the parents from when they're babies? And it went back and back and back to the point where I don't even know where to start at this point. And I'm glad that I got in contact with that professor because she does work with the family unit. She works with the mothers and the, and the young children. So I thought that'd be a good place to start to educate the mothers sort of about how they can raise their kids to have healthier mental health and be more aware of when issues arise and know where the resources are. Um, but even that, it's like, if it's already at the community level, so prevalent that people don't know, do I start with community outreach? I, I don't know yet. So that's, these conversations are helpful because they're giving me good perspectives. But. What you do is you start where you are with something small that you can do that's immediate. Yeah. And concrete. Mm -hmm. And that won't completely drain you. You have to do something that also feeds you, that also energizes you mm -hmm. because it's an area that will burn you out. And that's what happened. And I, my burnout happens because of the, oh, I was too ambitious. Um, and what was possible, I could see so many things that I wanted to do and I tried to do them all. And I had too many demands in my um, family life to allow me to overextend in both places. So you have to be smart about protecting your resources. Yeah, yeah. That's something that I've heard from a lot of people and it's something that I think about because pretty much any career path that I consider is pretty heavy and has the potential to burn me out, but... Um, I'll tell you, I found that doing direct services 
and and teaching a half and half load worked pretty well yeah. because the kids that I was teaching energized me where if, when I get away you get into a, a direct service constant direct services or if you don't have unless your family and your social sector is feeding you you don't have the energy to do it full what I considered full time now I realize that what I considered full time was probably triple time, but I probably That's should have been thinking. Three jobs. <laughs> yeah. What did I know? <laughs> well, we have you're young, you have energy. 